Hi everybody, I'm Catherine and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be all about how I made a set of modernized 18th century stays with a zipper in front, a cute modern print of kitty fabric, and a modernized construction method that is relatively time-saving when it comes to typical 18th century stays construction. So if this sounds interesting to you, then keep on watching. Okay, so first of all, I want to give a shout out to Modes For You, who is the fabric company who sent me the fabric for this project that I'm making. Modes For You is a fabric company. They're based in Hong Kong, but they sell a lot of Japanese fabric and they sell a lot of really cute prints like this one that I'm wearing. I think modern prints can come in really handy when it comes to history bounding because you can essentially take a historical pattern and just sew it straight from the pattern with no alterations whatsoever. But if you sew it in a modern print of fabric, it instantly modernizes it and makes it applicable to any modern day wardrobe. Modes For You has so many options of fabrics. Not only do they have prints, but they also have beautiful solid color fabrics made of natural fibers like cotton and linen. And if you want, you can check out my previous video about how to make a circle skirt, for example, of a beautiful organic poplin that their store carries that I made a lovely circle skirt out of. Their prices are affordable, customer service is great, shipping's affordable, and I highly recommend them. If you're interested in checking out their website and making a purchase of fabric for your next project, I do have a code that you can use. It's Catherine Sewing, and you can get 10% off of your order for the next couple months. Okay, so now let's get into the pattern choice for this set of 18th century stays or this 18th century corset, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you watched my Tale of Two Corsets video where I make Torian corset and then a set of 18th century stays, you'll be familiar with my woes when it came to attempting to self-draft a pattern for 18th century stays. And I really just wanted a quick and easy option for this project where I could just pump out a set of stays, they'll be done, they'll fit, and no worries. So I went with the Augusta Stays pattern by Virgil and Scroop. This is a pattern that I've been basically salivating over for the past couple years. They just look so beautiful and there's so many options of how to make them unique for your particular style that you're going for or your particular size or fit preference. And they're just so beautiful and attractive in the boning layout and just the overall shape of them. And they look like they would be really just supportive to your figure, no matter what your size is, because they're a nice long length, but they ride up higher over the hips. So they look really comfortable. So that was the option that I went with for this set of stays. Now, I believe they have their pattern available both in a physical form that they can mail to you or in a PDF form. I got the PDF form because I just wanted it as soon as possible. And so I downloaded it and I printed out my paper pattern and taped it together. Now they do also offer very detailed instructions about how to construct these stays. And I think this pattern for that reason would be great for a beginner stays maker. And in fact, even if you've never made any kind of corset before, I think this pattern is very approachable for you. They also have very helpful information about fitting this pattern to your body. And if you're making a mock-up, they offer the pretty great suggestion that I'd never heard before of making a mock-up out of cardboard, which I did sort of semi attempt to do, but I realized it wouldn't have worked because I used a very thick cardboard and it just wasn't taping together properly. It wasn't flexible enough, but I think cardboard would work wonderful for a mock-up if you used a thin sort of cereal box type of cardboard. So when it comes to the sizing for the pattern, the Augusta stays is sized based on your bust measurement. And they have two different size ranges. They have the curvy fit and then they have the straight fit. So the curvy fit is if your waist measurement is 12 inches or more smaller than your bust measurement. The straight fit is if your waist measurement is about 10 inches smaller than your bust measurement. And so I actually went with the curvy fit, which on the surface seemed a little bit scary because my bust measurement is 36 which would make my waist measurement 24. But as you'll see later, even though I sewed up that size, it didn't 
going to end up being that small. And generally I am more of a curvy figured person with my waist being like smaller proportionally than my bust is. So I just figured the curvy fit was a good option for me. And believe it or not, I actually didn't even make a mock-up for these stays and it still turned out wonderfully. So I really recommend this pattern. I think that's a good test for a pattern, how well it turns out, even when you don't make a mock-up. Of course you should always make a mock-up, but this pattern's great because I didn't make a mock-up at all and it turned out wonderfully. This pattern is multi-size, meaning there's different lines that you can cut or trace over depending on what your size is. And the great thing about that is that you can grade between sizes. So let's say you're super large in your bust and super small in your waist, you can grade between sizes. You can get like a really large bust measurement and then grade down to a super small waist measurement. So when I was cutting out my pattern, I kind of chickened out a bit and I was like, uh, 24 inches sounds a bit small for waist measurement. I think I'm gonna go for the next size up for the waist measurement and stay at the 36 size for the bust measurement. So that's how I cut my pattern and that is how I initially sewed my stays, but we'll get into later how I changed that. Oh, I wanted to mention one more thing about the pattern for the Augusta stays. So not only does it come with two fit ranges, the curvy and the straight, but it also comes with a theatrical view and a historical view. So the theatrical view is supposed to be a more simplified, quick, easy to sew version. And then the historical view is supposed to be just the historically accurate view, which also has front crisscross lacing going about halfway down. And I think that's what really makes these stays so beautiful. Obviously I didn't choose to do that in this pair, but I do plan on using this pattern again and making a historically accurate set with the front lacing as well. Cause I just think it's so pretty and it also adds that more adjustability for the fit. So it also has instructions based on whether you're going with the uh, simplified construction method or the historical construction method. So in my case with this particular set, I really didn't follow the instructions at all because I was just going with a totally modernized, just very quick construction method, which was like both sets of instructions were still too slow for me for what I was going for this project. Mind you, I love historical sewing techniques and I've made sets of stays before that were totally historically accurate. Well, somewhat historically accurate. I still use my sewing machine for the boning channels most of the time. But anyway, I've made stays using the historical construction method before. So if you're interested in seeing that, then check out my 1790s stays video and my maternity stays video, which I will link above or below or something. Okay, so now let's talk about the fabric that I used for this project. And this will be great to watch if you're planning on making a set of stays, especially if you're planning on making the Augusta stays. So I'll get into what the pattern recommends. So this pattern recommends using, I believe, a minimum of two layers of fabric, but probably three layers of fabric. So the outer layer would be your fashion layer, which is optional technically, and it could be something very, very thin, like a silk or a thin, I don't know, any kind of thin fabric, a lightweight linen, whatever. And then you need two strong layers of fabric and your two inner layers are kind of dependent on what your outer layer is. So let's say you have a really thick and tough outer layer, you might not need something so thick for the inner strength layers. And on the contrary, if you have a very thin outer layer, you might want something really strong for the inner layers. Or if one of your inner layers is super, super, super thick, like a cutile, then you might not need something as thick for the third layer. You might just want to use like a linen as opposed to another layer of cutile. I want to keep this project really simple. I wanted to stick within fabrics that I already had. So as I mentioned, I used this cute kitty fabric that Modes for You sent me. It's technically called a canvas, it's still a canvas, but it was very lightweight canvas. So I knew I would need something really, really thick and strong for the inner layers. So I used this wonderful canvas fabric that I bought on Amazon, which was super affordable and it's very thick and tough. I actually used it for my mock-ups in my Tale of Two Corsets video, and I'd bought enough where I had plenty of extra to make this project out of. So I used two of those layers for the inner strength layers. I was a little skeptical about if I should really be using two layers of these canvas. I kind of thought, mm, maybe I'll use one layer of the thick canvas and then one layer of muslin. But 
I referred to the instructions again and they did recommend using two thick layers. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll do it. And in hindsight, I'm glad I did that. And I also think these stays will become broken in more over time and they will soften up, I'm sure. And you do really want something thick and tough because it will minimize the chance of pieces of boning wearing holes through your stays over time, which in my experience has been the number one factor that shortens the life of any type of corset is when the boning pokes holes through the top or the bottom. And in some corsets that's happened to me quite quickly. So your fabric choice is really quite important. Okay, so now let's talk about cutting out the pattern. So the good thing about this pattern is that it has the seam allowance all included. So you don't have to worry about adding that. And it's also easier when it comes to just setting out your pattern pieces on the fabric because you already know that the seam allowance is all included. So it's very easy to visualize. So believe it or not, even though I was using a modernized construction method, I did use the historical view pattern pieces. And the reason for that is they, that the main difference between the historical and the theatrical view in this pattern is that the theatrical view has a closed center front. It's just cut on fold, so it's just all one piece. And I knew that I was going to have a zipper closure in the front, so I wanted to have that extra width of seam allowance in the center front. And they actually give you quite a wide swath of extra seam allowance. And I think that's good because it just helps reinforce the front area, almost like what a busk would do. It just has that extra layer of canvas in there that makes it that much firmer. All I did was I just laid up my pattern pieces on my fabric, both my cat fabric and my canvas fabric. I traced around each piece with my tailor's chalk, marked my notches and cut them out. And again, I cut out enough for one layer of the cat fabric and two layers of the canvas fabric. Now I'd like to give a word about accuracy. So it is always recommended, especially in stays and corsets, to not only cut out your fabric with the seam allowance, but to also mark the stitching line. Usually this is done with thread by basting. And I have always done this in the past, but I just didn't do it this time because this was just gonna be a fast, easy project and sometimes it's okay to just have a palette cleansing project where you just kind of get it done and it just kind of cleanses your palette from whatever previous project you were doing, which in my case was my Victorian corded corset. And that was super time consuming and super accuracy focused. And so this one, I just wanted to be quick and easy. So I didn't do that. And you know, it was less accurate. I'm going to admit that, but sometimes it's okay to be less accurate if it means you're not going to burn yourself out. Okay, so now let's get into the construction method for these stays. Um, right off the bat, I'm gonna give credit to Mariah Patty and her zipper stays video, which totally inspired me for the method that she used in making her stays, which is very quick and easy. And it totally eliminates the need for a separate lining. Because if you're not aware, usually stays, the way they're constructed, they're left with the raw seam allowance on the inside. And so usually this needs a lining to be sewn in to hide all the seam allowance and I just wasn't feeling like doing that this time so I used this construction method which I'm about to show you and if you'd like to see traditional methods of making 18th century stays then again check out my 1790s stays video and my maternity stays video so right off the bat I'm going to explain that the way I worked with the three layers of fabric for these stays so there was the cat fabric and then the two layers of the Amazon canvas. I'm gonna call it Amazon canvas. I had the cat fabric working with one layer of canvas and then the other layer of canvas. And so the first step was inserting my zipper to the center front. I basically just sandwiched the cat fabric with the layer of canvas, zipper, and then the other layer of canvas on top of that. Sew it along the edge with my zipper foot and then turned everything right side out and pressed and there's my zipper and I did that on both sides of course. Oh and I want to mention that immediately after inserting my zipper into the center front panel I did also add a boning channel directly next to the zipper and then for the next piece I would just sew right sides together the cat fabric the canvas the other cat fabric in the canvas for the next panel so right sides together, 
turn and press, and then also for the underside, I would sew the canvas and the other layer of canvas for the next panel and flip right side out. And I just kept repeating this until I reached the end, the center back panel. And so what I did for the center back panel is I just simply pressed with my iron the edges, seam allowances inside, and then sewed as close to that edge as I could. Now another great aspect of this modern construction method that really speeds it up is the taping of the seams. So normally 18th century stays will have tape of some sort like fabric tape running over the gutters of the seams to hide them and normally this has to be sewn on with a whip stitch completely by hand and that's the like the most annoying part of the process for me because it's really hard in your fingers because the boning is already inserted at that point so it's really really stiff to sew into but with this method I sewed on the tape or the seams by machine before the boning was inserted and so not only did this pretty it up and hide the seam gutters, but it also helped hold the outer layer to the inner layer along the seams, which is of course what you want when you're working with two layers in a corset. You want to hold them together at the seams. Okay, so now let's talk about the process of adding boning. So right off the bat, I'm going to say that I'm not like an orthodox sewer. I do not like using carbon paper or like basting to perfectly exactly accurately mark things like boning channels from the paper pattern to my fabric. I would much rather just do it by eye and accept the less accuracy that results from that but the greater ease and convenience. I do think I have a pretty good sense of proportion just because of my history of it drawing and painting and whatnot so I would always refer to rely on that than just the clunky method of transferring markings and again this doesn't mean I'm totally accurate. I think a big part of it is I'm just okay with inaccuracies. I'm probably a lot more okay with inaccuracies than most sewers would be. Honestly, I just don't really care and I don't think anyone's gonna be like looking up close and be like, oh my gosh, this bone is five millimeters wider out than the bone on that side. Bad. Like no one's gonna be doing that, I'm sorry. So what I did was I printed out the piece of paper from the Augusta Stays that just has all the pattern pieces in very small scale showing the boning layout. Now, if you're making the Augusta Stays pattern, they do also provide full size pattern pieces with the boning channels marked on them. So you can use that with your carbon paper to trace them out. No shame if you wanna do that. Everyone has their own method. This is just my method. So I just used the one piece of paper. So I saved on paper, saved on printing, and I just looked at it. I just had it next to my fabric. I had my piece of fabric that I was working on, had my tailor's chalk, and I would just look at it and just mark my boning channels. And I wasn't even too careful about marking the exact like left side and right side of the boning channel. I was mostly just marking the overall placement and direction of each boning channel because I knew that once I was at my sewing machine, I could just use my sewing machine foot as a guide for how wide to make each channel. Now what I really like about the Augusta stays, especially for a beginner, is that it doesn't have any crisscross boning like most historical stays patterns do. It's all just vertical boning. There are some pieces of boning at the tabs that kind of like go into another strip, but there's no actual crisscross channels. So that makes it a lot easier. So when I was sewing the boning channels, I did use my walking foot. This is optional, but if you have one, I would recommend using it at this point because it just minimizes fabric bubbling. And as you will see, I did still have some fabric bubbling, so that's definitely a drawback of the modern construction method where you're adding your boning channels once all the panels are already connected. There is more likelihood for fabric bubbling up, but whatever, it's okay. So after I finished sewing all my boning channels, it was time to insert my boning. And I used a big roll of synthetic whalebone for this, which I love because you can cut it with scissors. You don't have to worry about using like tin snips and filing down the ends and having to seal the ends like you do with steel boning. You just cut it with scissors, smooth out the edges with a file. You can even use a nail file. And so that's what I did. I would just measure out a given strip of boning for a given channel, cut it and insert it in.
I did have issues with this. I would have to use my pliers to kind of like grip it and shove it in because my channels were a bit too tight. And another great thing about synthetic whalebone is that if you accidentally sewed a couple channels too narrow and you don't want to rip out the whole channel and redo it, you can take scissors and cut the strip of boning to be just a little bit narrower and just shove it in that way. It's a lot easier. Okay, so now let's talk about setting the eyelets. So as you can probably guess, I did like to do this process mostly by eye, although I used a paper folding method, which I originally learned from Mariah Patty, where you take a strip of paper the length of your center back, you fold it in half, then you fold it in half again, then you fold it in half again, and you just keep doing that until you have evenly spaced folds that are about the distance you want your eyelets to be apart. But then I altered it a bit because at the waist area, I wanted my eyelets to be a little more closely spaced together. Oh, and I'd like to mention that I had my eyelets set in a way that was specifically for crisscross bunny ears lacing. If I was doing the historically accurate spiral lacing, the eyelet would be the eyelet setup would be completely different. And again, you can refer to my other stays video for information about that. So I set my eyelets using two-piece metal eyelets and an industrial hammer eyelet setting kit from Farthing Hills Corset Making Supply, which I really, really love. I really recommend it. It's a lot easier on your wrists than using those eyelet setting pliers. And sometimes the pliers don't work really well and they can be confusing as to which pieces to use and everything. So I prefer the hammer setting method. So I did this using, again, the kit, the eyelets, and a little anvil as my hitting base and a rawhide mallet. I didn't get footage of this because I do it in my basement on a workbench and it's just kind of a little difficult to film, but it went really quick and it was really easy and I really recommend that kit from Farthing Hills. So I added all my eyelets at center back as well as the eyelets at the top here and the strap. So finally, let's talk about binding the edges. This is probably the hardest part of making 18th century stays because you have to sew the binding by hand and you have to sew it around all of these tabs. I will say that the hardest point is when you're sewing the first pass just in your head because you still know like, oh my gosh, I still have to do this all over again on the second half. But usually the good news is the second half goes faster than the first half because it's already all attached and everything. You just need to sew it down on the front. So first I sewed it by hand along the bottom using a catch stitch, both for the top and the bottom of the tabs. And then after I did the first pass, then I folded it up and over and I sewed it down on the front. And then I laced it up using the crisscross method with bunny ears. And finally the stays were complete. So I finished my stays and here I am. I'm actually going to be trying them on for the first time in front of the camera and we're gonna see exactly how they fit and what I think of them. Okay, so sorry, you're not gonna be able to see my face for this, but I mostly want you to see the stays. So you can see I have them laced up quite loosely at the back and I'm going to be doing up the zipper much the same way you would do up a busk if this was a corset with a busk. I've had, I have had some issues with this zipper. Oh, there, I got it up. Okay. So the zipper's done up. Now I'm gonna start tightening up. So I'm gonna find those bunny ears that I made. And of course, this is not a historically accurate lacing method. Stays historically would have been laced with spiral lacing. We're not being historical with this project. Again, I'm pretty slow at this because I've never um, put these stays on before. So I don't really have a feel for where the little X's are yet. This is my second time making stays with crisscross lacing and bunny ears. The first time was in my Tale of Two Corsets video where I made the stays mock-up. And you know what? I actually think I might prefer <laughs> spiral lacing for stays because the thing about spiral lacing is although it's a bit more like slow, it holds its tightness better than crisscross lacing once you have it tightened up. But it's kind of bubbling out a bit at the waist where the bunny ears are. So the waist is pretty tight on these stays. I've actually never had a pair of stays yet that were tight fitting on the waist. My first pair was my maternity stays, which obviously weren't tight on my waist. And then I made jumps, which are sort of like stays. And then I made um, 1790s very short stays and they didn't fit me very well. And they didn't offer any tummy support. So this is my first time with a pair of stays that actually is a bit constricting on the waist. So here's the back. 
side, the front. The posture support is definitely great in these days. Oh my gosh, I really like them. I think this is gonna be my new favorite corset. I have been wearing my Victorian corded corset every day, but I think this, these might be my new go-to corset wear. We'll see. I did also tighten up the shoulder straps, as you can see. So I really do like the support of the shoulder straps. They add a bit of bust support, posture support. They kind of pull your shoulders back depending on how tight you have the straps. And I just love tabs, oh my gosh. Tabs are amazing because you don't have to worry about fitting the hips. The tabs just naturally splay out to whatever width your hips naturally are. And I think they look really cute and flattering. Okay, everybody. So just to wrap things up, I'd like to give a huge thank you again to Modes for You for spend sending me the fabric for this project. Definitely check them out. They're a great fabric website with lots of options, especially for cute history bounding projects like this one. And again, you can use that code Catherine Sewing to get 10% off your order for the next two months. So thanks so, so much for watching this video, guys. Leave your comments and questions below. Give it a like. Subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Oh, and also check out the accompanying blog posts, which will be in the description, and we'll get into more of the making details if this is something you're interested in making yourself. I also have a newsletter that comes out every week on my blog that you can sign up for on my blog. And I also have a Patreon account that I recently set up. So if anyone, any of you want to support me on there, then feel free. The link will be in the description. Thanks so much for watching guys and I'll see you soon. Bye.